I get excited by the mundane. There's all this amazing stuff around you that you just take for granted. Why don't we dive a little deeper in there and figure out how it's a part of your life? If I have some curiosity, I'm going to try to pull on that thread and figure out if the information is useful or relevant or good to have in my back pocket. I think that the technology discussions, this stuff gets interesting when you can conceive of the alternative. I can't think of the alternative for the internet. One of my hobbies is analog photography. The difference is you don't hate people who use digital cameras. <laughs> what need is the metaverse meant to satisfy? That's my entire response where it's like, no, 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 no. We need to be connecting in real life with people more. It is a very uncanny valley type thing where it's like, no, that's worse. Hey, welcome to the Create Unknown, the home of Make Something Mean Something. It is TCU's Day. We are here every Tuesday, 6 p.m. Eastern, live on Discord. I am Kevin Lieber, and with me, as always, is Matthew Tabor. Yeah, and I I wore a sweatshirt tonight that is that is guest-themed. You know, a sweatshirt, you just pull it on and that's it. There's nothing to a sweatshirt. No, this is a this is a high tech sweatshirt. Uh, DeWalt makes a really good heated heated hoodie that's powered by the same little packs as my power drill. So um, yeah, I, I'm just really in like I the twenty third century. This. You've right never now. mentioned this to me before. You have a well, electric yeah. hoodie. Yeah, yeah. You see the little light on it. Uh -huh. I know pe people listening can't see this, but yeah, it adjusts like low, medium, and hot, and uh, it just has like the the big yellow battery pack that. That my all my tools run on. <laughs> Wait, so it has is that is that cumbersome or it's okay to carry around you know, a battery? I thought it. <laughs> yeah, I thought it would be. Um, I, I primarily got it for mowing when it's cold, and I'm just sitting down there, and so it wouldn't make a difference. But there's a pocket for it, and I don't notice it at all. Like you'd think it would be bulky and weird to have this in your your front pocket, but. It's not. So I love this thing. Uh, I, I haven't had to wear it in a long time. Like during recording, I haven't because it's been so warm. But, you know, it's a, it's in the 40s now and I, I need a little little cheat code. It's turned into an accidental De DeWalt <laughs> electric sweatshirt uh, ad read at the top of this. Uh, totally yeah, right. unpaid. Yeah. But hey, you know, we're just trying oh, to help God. people out, get them the latest Can technologies. It? And uh, it's all part of today's episode. So it fits. That's right. Well, since we're talking about technology, Alec Watson is the Vsauce of technology. He makes exhaustive, in-depth videos on topics you didn't even know you needed to understand, and by the end, you just plain feel smarter. And that's because you are. I know it worked that way for Kevin, who watched Alec's 22-minute video on the can opener, and then he immediately bought one. The first few videos on the Technology Connections YouTube channel were about sound. The vacuum tube's importance in radio and how cylindrical Edison records evolved into the flat discs that somehow spit out all of your Leonard Skinner music. In the seven years since, Alec has gone deep into electric vehicles and heat pumps, revealing how we harness physics and engineering to improve the human condition. It is interesting to find out what's actually inside a lava lamp, but a few of Alec's titles reveal what the channel is really about. Lessons from a can opener, or the birth of photography being a way to draw with light. These videos are about what we need, which can be what we think we need versus what we truly need, how people use things to meet those needs, how humans pull elements and minerals and plants out of the ground and use experience and ingenuity to forge them into something that taps both the practical and imaginative definitions of the word fantastic. To do that capably, let alone in a way that generates 200 million views, requires a singularly brilliant mind and an uncommon understanding of both people and the world they live in. That is Alec, and that is Technology Connections. Every invention from the first caveman's club to the time machine is up for discussion tonight, but let's start with an easy one. Alec, what's the most exciting piece of technology no one ever thinks about? Oh my goodness. I could have used some prep time on that question. <laughs> uh, You've been prepping all your life, though. <laughs> that's true, but I, I get excited by the mundane, and that's 
that's a big part of what, you know, my whole channel is, is like, there's all this amazing stuff around you that you just take for granted. Why don't we dive a little deeper in there and figure out how it's a part of your life, what it's doing. Um, so I guess what I'd have to say is that I've never done a video about this because I think it's just too wide for me to do, but it would be the power grid in general. I think it's oh. definitely the most powerful thing, pun intended. Is that what you asked me though? Is it powerful? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think a lot of people think about about the complexity of of the power grid very often. It's one of those things that that just kind of works. You know, like I get in my car and eh, for the most part, I turn the key, I make sure that I have enough gas to do what I'm doing, and I don't really think about what's what's happening in that unit. Uh, and I, I, I think that was really the intent of the question. It's like, what's the big thing that without it, we would be in very, very bad shape or uh, we would lose some serious quality of life. Uh, but, but nobody considers that. And I, I think power grid is a pretty good answer there because people only think about, you know, about the line that runs to their house. Like <laughs> they think about it when a tree falls down on it or like when their block goes out of power. Now, I was going to say, if that, I think they think of yeah. plug thing in wall, get juice. Right. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Or flip switch and light comes on. And, and that's, yeah. that's the extent it's now, now, now I'm on to thinking about whatever it is that I actually want to think about. And I'm done thinking about this miracle in the wall, <laughs> basically. Miracle in the wall. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. It, yeah, I'm I'm glad, Alec, that you mentioned the the mundane because that's literally where I wanted to start this entire episode with you because it encompasses your channel. It encompasses what I love about your channel, and it was literally the subject of a TEDx talk that I did years ago, um, where. The, the, the entire point of it was that we're surrounded by all of this absolutely stunning and virtually impossible to conceive of, you know, technology and advancement and wizardry. And <laughs> nobody cares. It's like, it, never think about it. Just move on with your life. The only, the only time you ever think about it is when the thing breaks and you're like, this stupid thing, what a piece of crap. I hate this toaster. And it's like that toaster is amazing. Um, the yeah. I, I think the the title that uh, of the the talk that I did was "Our Amazing Boring World," and I'll skip yes, you. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll give you the cliff notes and, and make you skip the entire talk and just get to the point. the The point at the end, the conclusion was that the the greatest thing that a human can achieve is to create an invention so amazing that it becomes boring. Yeah, I think that's that's a good way of putting it because it, it is it's one of those things that like when it becomes boring, it's definitionally part of our lives. It's not mm -hmm. new and exciting anymore. It's just a core foundation of how we do things. And um thinking of the power grid, like I don't think anybody ever goes through an audit of all the things in their life that are connected to the power grid and oh. what it would be like if because we know when the power goes out, well, those of us in areas where that happens regularly, how often um, or we know when the power goes out, all the things that suddenly aren't there for us. But like so <laughs> I've been fascinated by refrigerators lately. Like I have a OK, I have a real appreciation for my refrigerator because it's like we haven't had a machine that you can put food in and expect it to stay good for like much longer than a century if that i don't i don't remember exactly when the first home refrigerators were available but you know i could not imagine life without a refrigerator but it, it wasn't it that long forces, ago that we didn't have yeah, it it forces you to live very differently um which by the way you'll appreciate this we had to record one episode of this podcast by uh by oil light you know using a, a hurricane lamp like one of your videos uh, oh, really <laughs> on the shape yeah yeah it could be because uh, uh one of us and i won't say which one because it's me uh <laughs> loses power quite frequently ah. um but uh, uh yeah think about how you would have to live differently if you couldn't refrigerate things you would have to procure all of those all the stuff that would go bad constantly you couldn't have milk that was around for a while, so you're going to get that or somebody is delivering it to you. The meat that you buy, you're going to have to buy that really every day or two 
uh, you can't keep that around for very long. Uh, if you do, you're looking at, at preservation of meat as opposed to just, you know, straight cooking things up. So your styles there are going to be different. Um, it, it just completely alters how you live very basic parts of your life. And it's something now that it's just there, you know, it's just like, like nobody would ask if they moved into a furnished apartment, nobody would be like, can you confirm that this has a refrigerator? Like, no, you don't ask if it's going to, if it has a toilet either. Like, oh, do I, do I have to go in buckets or do you have indoor plumbing here? I just want to make sure. No, it's that uh, point of irrelevance that Kevin mentioned. And, and I think there's, there's a, an even higher level uh, from uh, that state of a thing being boring. You've really made it when your tech becomes boring. And y- you've like epically, legendarily made it when your tech has become forgotten, like completely out of mind. If it doesn't exist in people's mind at all, y- you've absolutely like hit the pinnacle of, of tech. Yeah, I, would, I would definitely agree with that statement. It's, and like the internet is getting there rapidly. In fact, it pretty much to me is I could not imagine life without an internet connection. I mean, it's, of course, I do my living on the internet, so it's a bit more right. profound for me than it might be for other people. But um, it's it's almost to the point where if I an internet uh, disruption is a bigger disruption for me than a power disruption. Mm. Well, it, well, you know what? When we had to do that, when I lost power and we had to break out the the oil lamps, well, they're always out, but, you know, light them up. I didn't have an internet problem. I just used, uh, used my phone. You know, I tethered my phone to my, my MacBook and we kept rolling on that. So yeah, internet wasn't disrupted at all. Uh, and that's kind of crazy when you think about it, that, um, (laughs) yeah, like you lose power, you lose everything, but you don't lose the internet. Yeah. It's, it's pretty good. I, um, I have two profound thoughts in my head at the same time relating to internet infrastructure and electric infrastructure. Um, but it is both of those infrastructures. I think people would have more appreciation for if they realize how together it all is. Um, and specifically the power grid, the thing that we, this kind of came up with the Texas power issues a couple of years ago, but all of the generators that are on the power grid are spinning in sync with each other. They have to, if, if you try to connect a generator onto the grid and it's not in perfect sync with the rest of the grid, the forces that will be applied to the, uh, actual turbine or whatever the part what's called that actually spins and makes the energy would it would destroy itself it would just completely obliterate itself because it would experience a huge torque all of the generators are like helping each other and they're pushing energy and pulling energy onto the wires all together at the same time and it's that sort of interconnectedness that i I'd like to discuss in some future video, but I don't really know how, but that's the thing that, that I don't know when exactly I learned this, but I think it might've just been, it might have really sunk in. I saw a video on YouTube of someone connecting a hydroelectric station to the grid. It had been disconnected for some reason or maintenance. I don't know. And there's this big piece of equipment that they're watching that can tell it how close it is to synchronous with the rest of the grid. And they cannot connect it until that is close to perfect. And as soon as they do, now it's in unison with the rest of the grid and things can work correctly. And with network infrastructure, it's the same thing. When our power goes out locally, our modems might not work anymore. But if we have a cell tower close enough that is still connected with everything, we have that backup option. So that interconnectedness is something that personally, I, I wish we focused on a little more as far as rather than just the end point, but it's a little bit heady. Yeah. I I wish that anybody cared about any of this. That's the thing that kills me. (laughs) It kills me about this topic, man. It's going to be about this topic for a long time here. Here, here's a little uh, insider secret. Uh, I think first, first publicly, uh, ever discussed thing is that, uh, Matt and I have tried to pitch TV shows about this idea for years. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, yeah. Uh, uh, about this concept, mm-hmm. like, generally, about how we're mm-hmm. surrounded by amazing technology that we ignore, that we, you know, uh, sensory gate, essentially, um, out of our vision and, and senses. We just ignore, we just block it out and move on, you know, with our day because we're upset that uh, the football team lost or we're hungry. So we we're trying to figure out what to eat for lunch, you know, the things <laughs> that people think about. 
and ignore the indoor plumbing and the baseboard heat and how that works and the light and everything absolutely everything the refrigerator that you're currently obsessed with and how integral <laughs> that is um but nobody cares like no one cares about this this, this subject nobody cared about my no. ted talk it has like no views nobody watches that thing and your channel which is wildly successful in my opinion should be 10 times as successful I genuinely think that like I, I truly I'm not I'm not just uh, like trying to inflate your ego here <laughs> because you were gracious enough to come on our podcast. I genuinely love this subject and believe that it's criminal that it's just widely ignored. So I don't really know why that is. Um, I guess it's just because people don't think beyond what the thing is doing and to just instantly take it for granted that you can walk around with a smartphone and just like watch clips of Nolan Ryan's no hitter yeah. from <laughs> 1994 right. or whatever instantly <laughs> uh, in the woods like that makes no sense but it's true um so the, i guess the question is how did you become one of the rare people interested in these sort of things and then develop that interest into creating this great YouTube channel dedicated to it. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I can't, as a tortured Midwesterner, compliments are hard for me to process. Uh, <laughs> but the um, it's funny you say this because if I go back to why I started the channel, it's kind of a bit, it's like that was a bugbear of mine, a hundred percent that I could be fascinated by the things around me. And I would try to explain to peers and school that like, no, this is really interesting. And they were just like, you know, deer in headlights. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and um, it was, I guess, stemming from that, like I need to find a way to make this interesting to you because the entire world around you is built by humans and it's fascinating and it would be better. I don't want to say it'd be better, but like life is more fun when you know how all this stuff works. And true. the um, the first video on my channel, well, actually, my whole YouTube career got started with my terrible old channel that people still find sometimes uh, by just recording an Edison phonograph. And a dear family friend had given me this phonograph, which was in his family since 1906, whenever it was uh, first purchased. And I don't know exactly when this happened, but once my brain clicked with, oh, this thing is literally just a mechanical ear running backwards. That was like mm. really profound. And it lodged in my brain like this is the physical nature of sound pressed into wax. And you can just do that in reverse and get the sound back. And uh, from then on, it was like, that's why I started the series on sound, because I thought it would be a good place to start. But um, in, nowadays, I I would not go into a series like that. That was the original plan. But it's just you can't hold people's attention over a span of months. Yeah, I, I feel like so, it almost becomes like, and this is going to sound crude, but it's true. It's like uh, people that are high think think about this stuff. <laughs> Shower thoughts. Yeah, level. yeah. Or it's oh. like I got so high, yeah. man, and I started thinking about how the TV works, and there's just like little people in the TV, and it, like it makes no sense, you know. And then and then, but then they sober up and they never look into it any further, but. I don't know Have what you that seen the is. the thing about the clip of Bjork talking about how a television works? Yes, it's amazing. Yeah. I like not. that's the. Oh, oh you would love it. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to pop it in the episode chat uh, because it's it's this kind of thing where like part of it is genius and part of it is this wild curiosity that everybody should have. And then part of it is is insanity, you know, like. You can't tell if this person should be on medication or off medication. You know, it's this odd, uh, blurry line between, you know, between reality and insanity. So uh, it's really cool to, um, you know, see somebody talk like that. But uh, sorry to interrupt on that. I just thought, Kevin, when you're talking about the TV works, I'm like, there's literally an example of this that's amazing. <laughs> no, and are we talking analog TV or modern TV? I don't know the clip. It's an analog TV. Was, it's an older, it's yeah, an older clip. Yeah. And she's just using her wild 90s, imagination yeah. about like, this is the little city where the little like, people. 
people live and they go through these tubes and you know she's just like <laughs> but she's fascinated by it and it's like yeah. uh, and i don't know anything bjork does i think is worth watching but um yeah it, that that's another thing that occurs to me that's a little strange about this like endeavor in general is that uh, uh, once you enter the domain of like thinking too much about a thing it gets sort of dismissed as like a shower thought or a high thought where it's like, this is just how people should think, but I guess not. Well, I, I think it is easy to be thinking too much about things and that can be part of it is um, like it's in my Twitter bio thinking about everything too much or something like that, because for things that like I can't understand or control and that bother me, it can you know, that's been one of my bigger struggles lately is I've, I'm actually in the middle of a break from Twitter because it's like at this particular moment in time, it's not been so fun for my brain to interface with it. But but yeah, as far as like thinking about the rest of the world, I don't know. I, I don't know where that fascination gap, I guess, is a good term for it oh, comes that's a from. Good way to put it. Mm hmm. I I want to I want to jump in and reference that TED talk that that Kevin mentioned, because uh it's so strange to me that that it seems like very few people are interested in how basic things work, right? They don't think about it. We've just talked about that. But then when they encounter a deep dive on that thing, they really love it. That's why they like your videos, Alec. That's why at that TED Talk, there were like 15 that day, right? This is the TEDx in, in Vienna a few years ago. I was there. And uh, Kevin's talk was the, the the keynote kind of thing. It was the end. It wrapped it all up. It was uh, the finale. So there were like 15 before that, and there were a lot of really good ones. Um, but that one crushed. It was absolutely finale worthy. And the reaction from people after, too, I mean, it was the highlight of that event. And it, it was this, this topic, that irrelevance of technology kind of thing. So over and over, we see different people taking exactly this thing that we're saying most people are interested in and seeing that when they're exposed to it, they go bananas. They really love it. They like thinking about it. They like realizing uh, the connections that they knew but didn't know. They like uh, seeing that simple things are more complex than they realized. They love it. So why do you get this disconnect between a thing that nobody does and when they do it, they love it. Like, how, how does that happen? I mean, I, I don't have an answer for it because to me, it's, it's, it's always been a case of like, if I have some curiosity, I'm going to try to pull on that thread and figure out if the information is useful or relevant or good to have in my back pocket. But I guess a lot of people just react to information and it doesn't really enter their brain any deeper than this is what they heard. I don't know. I don't have a, I really don't have a good explanation because you would think, or I would think that m knowledge is power as everybody says, but <laughs> you know, that's, that's corny, but it's not just powerful in sense of like more tools in your bag, but that, you know, the connections part of my channel's name is like everything relates to something else and you can piece it together and move forward. I don't know what you've been sipping, but you've got it all wrong. It's time to commit to the leaf. We've embraced the smoothness and surprising pick-me-up that tea provides. I literally drink it all day long, nearly a gallon a day, and it powers me through research, script writing, and forums on websites that I refuse to name here. But we don't drink normie NPC tea. We drink cultured and refined anime tea from the Dragon's Treasure. Kevin still likes the gunpowder green called Space Cowboy, and I've sampled nearly 40 Dragon's Treasure teas at this point. Lately, I've been slamming black teas like Kentucky Bourbon and Liquefied Berserk Despair. Scottish Breakfast is deep and peaty, and I smooth it over with Sebastian's Morning Earl Grey, which has the best vanilla cream taste I think I've ever had in a cup. Give me a pot of that with a hot meatball sub from Sal's Pizza and Brooks Barbecue Chicken to wash down my last meal on death row. I highly recommend the sampler pack you'll want to try everything just like I did. I literally have not had one tea that I wouldn't be happy to reorder. The Dragon's Wings membership fuels new tea experimentation and the Tea of the Month Club provides a regularly scheduled surprise. And when you order from the Dragon's Treasure using code CREATE, you'll get 10% off your order. That's 10% off using the code CREATE at thedragonstreasure.com. The link's in the description. 
do you think there's a, a, a generational difference on this attitude? Because I may be pulling a bit of a retcon here in my mind, but it seems like when, when we were kids, everybody was encouraged to think about these particular curiosities and you would even see programming that was kind of educational. I've, I brought up Mr. Wizard a lot because that show is so old and, and I loved it as a kid. Uh, Charles mentions PBS in the episode chat. PBS's content in the 80s and 90s was uh, was focused on the same kind of mindset. And it's like, um, which was it Mr. Rogers where they had this segment that's like, here's how crayons are yeah. made? Yeah, I think you know? that was Mr. Like, Rogers. Yeah, it, that was a staple of of uh, young people's programming and also how they were encouraged to think where it's like, you should look at the sky and understand why clouds look like they do and how something that's like filled with water can be floating many miles above your head. Like this is weird. So you should know how it works. Um, I feel like that's a little bit different now. And I, I wonder if, if uh, there's a difference in the experience because I think about like a 10 year old now, I, I don't know what they can take apart. I don't know what they can tinker with to the same degree. Whereas we were able to like disassemble and look at the insides of everything. I can't look at the inside of my iPhone. I don't know how it works. Um, it, it very well may be uh, a whole race of tiny people in there uh, doing what Bjork says happens in televisions. I don't know because I've never looked inside. Um, I, I do know how uh like a handheld video game worked in in 1985 because i could just open the thing up you know so <laughs> uh, i i wonder if if there's a difference in being deprived of that manual experience uh, of understanding that things can be broken down put back together and and reverse engineered i do think that's a huge part of it if if it's ha if it's not apparent from my content i don't interface with computers at all because to me they're not interesting it they're very interesting in that like they're so powerful the things we can do with them are like uh, i got into arduinos for a while and i was imagining um like oh god i had a thought when i was in high school at some point that like my parents had a really old dishwasher and we'll get to dishwashers later maybe but this very <laughs> old dishwasher i was thinking to myself you know if its control mechanism failed I could rig together an Arduino with a relay board and get this thing working pretty easily. Just build build a routine to run the the valves and the pumps for about as long as its mechanical timer does. Um, so that's like really profound, and I think that you know the world has moved forward so much because of that. But it's a lot less interesting to say there's a micro or a microcontroller with software running on it. And that software tells it to put power on these pins at certain times. And like that is already a step above, I think, what most people interface with modern technology because they just they don't know what a microcontroller is. They just know that they have a touch screen in front of them and it can show anything and they can push buttons. And it's almost like computers have unlocked so much that I guess it's what we were talking about earlier. It's it's not interesting anymore because mm. we just know that. A computer can handle all these things. We'll give it over to that. We didn't have to come up with some clever way to make, you know, um, not unintelligent technology. I don't like that word, but, you know, like an analog television. The fact that we've had that since the 40s or earlier, if you consider early um, experiments and whatnot, is just wild to me that we had that working without um, any sort of discrete logic. It was just triggers and very clever circuitry and electromagnets and vacuum tubes. And yeah, I, I I do think that for younger people who everything in their life is some version of a computer that's doing something, it's just less interesting. And that could be a big part of it. That's such an interesting thought. I love that. I never considered that before about how many things that we interface with that. Yeah, you can't open. And even if you were to open, <laughs> what are you looking at? <laughs> not, a, not a whole right. lot. You know, I forgot to mention. Yeah, I don't understand. It, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous that I didn't mention this last week because we spent an entire episode talking about mom and pop video stores and Blockbuster. Mm. <laughs> My dad was part owner of a video store when I was a kid. 
Uh, I just didn't mention that in, in that in our podcast, like literally when I was a kid, my dad was part owner of a video store. So I like grew up yeah. going to my own video store. I don't know how <laughs> I forgot, dude, like the, so yeah. after the episode, I'm like, how did up. I not mention that in that entire episode? I kind of, I didn't big remind deal. you because I'm like, if he, if he's not bringing this up, there must be a reason <laughs> for it. Like, I don't know if it's some weird doxing thing or what, <laughs> no. uh, but <laughs> But yeah, I'm I'm waiting for you to say it as we're talking about the experience this. And I'm like, Kevin, like this is not a foreign experience. I know. This is like your actual life and, and you're not detailing. That. I know my brain just goes in too many directions. And, you know, one of them I, I zigged and I should have zagged and I, 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 I just lost that thought. But it came back to me as you're talking about this, because in the back of this video store, it was called John's video. And in the back of John's video. There was Artie and Artie had a repair shop. And so the, the, the entire like back room of John's video was just, just TVs and VCRs pulled apart with parts all over the place. It was so cool That's as awesome. a kid to go in there and just see all, just piles and piles of like broken gadgets and, and little parts and Artie, this oh, man so like cool. hunched over them, like chain smoking, trying to fix these things. <laughs> so, so cool. You know, definitely had probably an impact on, on my psyche in more ways than, uh, than I, than I consciously understand, uh, in this moment. But, um, that was my childhood it was like, I was literally go to, an entire room of these parts where a guy's job all day was to like take things apart, put them back together, clean them, figure out what was going on. And that was a whole part that we didn't get into with the video store thing is of what sucked about owning a video store is that the, the tapes like, like VCRs would eat uh, the tapes oh, yeah. and oh, yeah, yeah. you know, now you're trying to like respool them and like flatten the tape out and <laughs> get it to work again and all that crap. You know, we don't have to, we already did the blockbuster episode. We don't have to relitigate that, but there's there was definitely meat on the bone that we left in that episode that <laughs> I forgot to mention. But yeah, that's a really interesting thing that kids today do not have and won't have. Like we're not going back to that. That's for sure. But um, uh, one thing. Oh God, you mentioned the dishwasher. When I watched that episode about those stupid pods, those things suck. I tried using those because I love the Tide Pods. They're so much easier and more convenient to use. So I got the ones for the dishwasher and they don't, they didn't work. It would just like gloop out and the dishes mm -hmm. and, and run along the, the door and the soap would not disperse at all within the dishwasher and the dishes would remain dirty. I just threw them all away and got, um, you know, like liquid detergent instead. So I loved your video because I was like, this, this speaks to my experience. <laughs> <laughs> I that video is probably my favorite as far as its impact because it you know it's so lovely to see comments and hear like my favorite comment in that video was like someone who said this is nonsense dishwashers are just fancy sanitizing machines have never been able to get a dishwasher to wash dishes I don't know what you're talking about and then you know it's been edited to say okay I tried everything you said and I can't believe how clean the dishes were uh -huh. and Thank you for explaining how dishwashers work. <laughs> and and <laughs> there's lots of comments like that. And I love it. And like literally thinking of bugbears, that was a bugbear of mine because I kept seeing all these things. I don't know how, but it would filter through my feed and comments of people complaining about dishwashers or like a um, energy and water regulations thinking that, oh, new dishwashers don't work because of that. And I'm just thinking to myself my entire life. I have had so many dishwashers that I've used and they all wash dishes. And the only thing I've ever done is listen to the thing that says pre-wash and I don't buy the pods. There might be something to this. <laughs> and so I put that video together and um, I'm just very happy that it, it got through to a lot of people. Although sales are still very poor for my powders and liquids compared to the pods. <laughs> well, that's one of the things I find really fascinating about your channel. And I was telling uh, Matt earlier today about the can opener thing, because you did this whole video about this. There's this phrase, build a better mouse trap. I'm, uh, if anybody like watches Shark Tank, they use that phrase all the time. Oh, you built a better mouse trap. Well, there, there was a better mouse trap built when it comes to mechanical or like hand crank can openers. 
And again, nobody cared. Like, and nobody still cares. And here you are being like, hey, you should care about this. <laughs> this is a better product. It's a safer product. Um, it's just as, as easy to use. You won't cut yourself. I have cut myself badly on cans in the past, uh, not at home, but at work. I used to work, I used to cook in restaurants, you know, prep cooking, you'd have to open like a ton of cans and you're doing it quickly because you, you know, just want to get it done. And after the 3,000th can that you've opened over the course of one's gonna how you. many years, yeah, <laughs> the, 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 you play the numbers game and one is going to get you. <laughs> and I got, I got got real bad once, split <laughs> open my hand with a can. Uh, with a lid, uh, cause them suckers are sharp. Well, guess what? No longer, you know, I feel <laughs> like we should do like one of those, uh, TV infomercials. There's got to be a better way. So <laughs> the point is I watched your video about the better way and bought the can opener and it's great. That's what I use now. And that's what everybody should use. So tell us the story behind the creation of this can opener video. And for people unfamiliar with the can opener, um, why don't you, just, you know, let them in on this great new mousetrap. Okay, well, so you can get what are usually marketed as safety can openers that rather than puncture the lid to open the can, they actually cut the seam of the can's lid. So the cut happens on the edge of the can, and basically there aren't any sharp edges from the cut. The The face of the can is still probably, you don't want to shove your hand in there, but the lid's not going to hurt you. And Quite honestly, I never tried one until a couple months before that video. I've known they existed. I referenced an episode of Everybody Loves Raymond that's been in my head where Deborah's like, she keeps telling him, but it doesn't have sharp edges. And um, what happened was, right, so I had gotten a can opener, which was terrible. <laughs> I just, you know, it was in my mind that can openers are all the same. I bought the $2 one and oh boy, that was smart. So I needed another can opener and somehow that video or that uh, episode of Raymond stuck in my head. And I was like, there's a different kind of can opener. Let me look for that. And so then I found it, bought it and was like, why are we not using these things? Why is this so obscure? And yeah, it got, I turned it into a video because it was like, what else is there in the world that's been out for 20, 30 years, but just never got anywhere because people are like, well, it's a can opener. So well, that was that was my big question in general because that that's exactly what I thought of after I watched that video. I'm like, what else, what else are we missing on? There could be better can openers in all kinds of ways, uh, in kitchen gadgets or tools or who knows that I don't know. Just nobody knows about. There's no yeah, technology well, connections stoves. video on it yet. So so, <laughs> <laughs> what's next? And, and what what have I missed? Yeah, I, I don't know. I would say in in the kitchen category induction stoves are probably about to have their moment although i keep hearing that like we're just way behind in the u.s and the rest of the world has embraced them uh citation needed i guess but um it's probably the next big kitchen thing because i think people are going to realize more and more as time goes on like i i have a gas stove in my home and it's just like uh the more i use it the more i'm like why do people like this this is like very primitive. And I think people like it because it's primitive, like, ooh, fire. Mm -hmm. But um, I have a CO2 monitor that I keep on as a recommendation from the Twitter account, Swift on Security. And man, just making a meal causes the CO2 to go up by five or 600 parts per million. And it's like, why do we still do this? So anyway, that's kind of a bit of a tangent there. But I think induction stoves, once they get saturation, we're going to look back because uh, it's understandable that people don't like old fashioned electric stoves. But induction's been around for, I think, 40 years, maybe. I think they first started coming out in the 80s, but they're just not have gotten anywhere recent until quite recently. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happened with the air fryer, isn't it? Is that's old tech convection it's oven just a convection? And they oh, just yes. stuck it in like oh, a, it a little like cat or, uh, you know, countertop size pod yeah. and all of a sudden it's like air fryer bro <laughs> that's that's on my list of things it's been uh <laughs> i just need to i need to make a video on air fryers but i want to do some experimentations because i have a convection oven and i want mm -hmm. my my personal theory is that the big thing about an air fryer is the basket it's not the thing itself and so i would just like to find some sort of wire basket that i can put in my convection oven and be like how different is this but it's all going to be subjective, so I haven't really 
put. Yeah, I, I don't see why the results would be any different at all, provided that you'd be able to grab onto it and give it a shake. You know, and so like uh, putting something in there where so like I use an air fryer a lot. I use it uh, for uh, practical reasons that like I you talked about Twitter getting to you occasionally um, that I, I, I'm kind of immune to it. But like twice a year, something really small makes me rage on Twitter. And in last year, one of those things was people shitting on air fryers because they don't understand that not everybody has uh, uh, has decent air conditioning in their house or any at all. And being able to have uh, something that replaces turning the oven on when it is hot as Hades, uh, the fact that you can cook something capably without generating very much heat in your kitchen is a tremendous asset in some houses in the summer. So like, yeah, I get that it's not a miracle device in, in terms of uh, replacing something that a lot of people have. You know, it is that little convection oven, but there's some really practical benefits like like uh, not having to cook nude because you'd be sweating to death if you had clothes on. You know, so. Uh, so that's pretty handy. Oh, sure. And like, I would imagine, I don't want to presuppose a conclusion, but I've been using toaster ovens for ages for the same reason mm -hmm. is that there's no point yeah. turning on the oven unless I need something that large. Um, so I can imagine if I do, cause that's the thing I'm going to need to engage with the magic of buying two of them and I'll need to get a, you know, whatever your prototypical air fryer is with the slide and basket. But then I'd also like to compare it to one of the toaster of an air fryer hybrids. I, um, my mom and dad have one and I've played around with it one time and it has a much higher velocity fan than I think even my full size convection oven. So mm -hmm. I think there's a difference as far as it probably is doing a little more than your bog standard convection oven, but yeah, that's that's really one of what I want to parse out. And I would definitely be saying like there's reasons to have a small countertop oven. I love them, but I yeah. I would go for a toaster oven before an air fryer. That would be my priority. So why not both in one device? Yeah, my my problem with the toaster oven in college is that, man, that thing was just on fire like, all the time. Not not me, but, you know, you live with people <laughs> and they're like oh. less than careful and they stuff the thing full of like, you know, French bread pizzas and the oil is just dripping all over the place. And now you have a fire in the kitchen. Just saying that happened uh, more than a few times <laughs> in my life. Well, I, I have noticed that they now all have screen printed on them. If contact, if contents ignite, unplug oven and keep door closed or something like that. <laughs> so <laughs> right. apparently that's so a big enough problem. Huh? Yeah. I yeah. saw it a lot. I don't really have the counter space for a toaster oven uh, because I have this, you know, old small kitchen. But I also, I just I have an aversion to to toasting things. I mean, if you toast things too much, what? if you start toasting, you don't stop. And then all of a sudden you're British and all you do is eat toast. <laughs> oh, well, I you put I, beans on it. I should clarify. My toaster oven has no toasting role whatsoever because I firm, oh, oh, it doesn't. I firmly believe that toaster ovens make terrible toast. I know some people are going to mm. tell me, oh, I have one that works really great, but they take too long to heat up so that bread always dries out. It's I mean, oh. maybe I'm just using it wrong, but everyone that I've ever tried, it's like this takes four times as long as a toaster because it's got a preheat. It's basically like baking bread and turning it into toast. And so I love a toaster oven, but not for toast. I just use it as a small oven. I love this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's so good. It's so good. I never thought about that before, but that makes perfect sense. You're baking it into toast and that sucks when really mm, you want yeah. to just sear, sear the bit. outside oh, yeah. of it as quickly yeah. as possible. And then the inside really hot, can really remain fast. fluffy and delicious. Yeah, exactly. A little bit moist. We want to help you make something and mean something. And we say that phrase all the time because when you're making something and you know it means something, even if it's just to you, that's when you feel pretty good about what you're creating. 
The support for the Create Unknown in recent weeks has been incredible. Animators, artists, musicians, YouTubers, aspiring filmmakers, comedians, it is crazy how talented everybody in this community is. Consider joining the Create Unknown Patreon. Every dollar that comes through goes straight into the podcast and its community. That means more highlights videos. It means a big Minecraft project that's on the way. And eventually we'd like to manufacture custom piss bottles so you never have to leave your battle station. And being a patron unlocks participation in all of our live recordings. You've seen the roster of guests we've had. Having access to their minds is a unique opportunity. You can go to patreon.com slash thecreateunknown or click the link that's in the description. Every little bit helps and your support means absolutely everything to us. Patreon.com slash thecreateunknown. Links in the description. We appreciate you, Space Cowboys. Um, I think I've developed a theory as we've talked about this. What is it? I'm, I'm going to spit out my theory and then I want to hear what you guys think of it. I think that the technology discussions and thoughts about them, whether it's it's you know a conversation like we're having or you're just sitting around uh, thinking about you know, your toaster oven uh, as you're in the kitchen. I think this stuff gets interesting when, when you can conceive of the alternative. Okay. And, and here's, here's what popped into my head thinking of, we talked about a dishwasher, think about a clothes washer. So you throw your clothes in, uh, you throw whatever soap in, you choose the setting you want, push a button and go. That's awesome. If you didn't have that, you would have to, uh, procure water, probably make it hot. Uh, for, for people don't, who don't know how clothes used to be washed uh, by hand, you know, you'd have something like lye uh, and soap and you would by hand uh, scrub on a washboard to get a little bit of agitation on the, on the, the garment uh, to get the, the dirt out. This was uncomfortable on your fingers and knuckles and it was extremely slow. And then you'd have to run it through a ringing device uh, to squeeze that water out and then hang it to dry. Now I'm, I'm even oversimplifying the process too, but when you use a washing machine for clothes, you have a sense of what you would have to do without that. You know that you would be doing it by hand. It would be slow. It would suck. I can't think of the alternative for the internet. I can't think of, of the next best alternative for a computer. I mean, the closest thing is like, uh, typewriter, but, but they're not the same. They're not the same thing at all. So it's not even, uh, a, a remotely similar, uh, comparison. Whereas hand washing versus washing machine is dishwasher versus washing dishes by hand. Anybody can look at that and know exactly what the alternative is and why this thing is better. Well, and I think there's a class of tech where like when it goes beyond that and you can't conceive of the alternative, people lose interest. I agree, but specifically with specifically with dishwashers, an interesting thing mm -hmm. kept coming up in comments again and again, and it was one of those bugbears. I don't know why this happens, but people will complain that a dishwasher takes two hours to wash dishes and they could do it themselves by hand faster. And I'm like, OK, but when it's when it's washing dishes, you're not. Have you thought about that? <laughs> and right. it was it was like. So talking about the alternatives, some people can't imagine them, or I don't know if ima if they can't imagine them is correct, but like, I think that everything we talk about, like the toaster oven is a great example, or in the air fryer in, in a lot of cases, and I fully agree with what you were saying, having a small countertop operated thing that doesn't get the whole freaking house warm just to make some Tostitos or whatever. That's mm -hmm. not Tostitos is, is a, that's a chip. But, you know, Totinos. <laughs> let's do Totinos because Tot pizza rolls. Yeah, there you they're go. Good gamer food. Get some yeah. pizza rolls going. And so, like, you can have a discussion which makes sense. Like, you could say, OK, well, I live in a small home. I don't have a lot of counter space, so I'm willing to turn on the oven for that. Or someone says, mm -hmm. I live in a home that doesn't have good air conditioning or doesn't have air conditioning at all. I'm not going to turn on my oven between May and Nova of October. But I think there's a lot of interesting discussions that happen there when it's clear um, when you can discuss what would it be like if you didn't have this option. And I actually think in the clothes washer, the penetration is just so thorough that nobody even thinks about hand washing clothes anymore in parts of the world where washers are common, of course. And dishwashers are in this weird place where most people have them, but there's a lot of people that don't. And the people who don't have them 
I don't know. I, I don't know where it comes from, but I kept getting the sense of like, oh, you people are so lazy using a dishwasher. And it's like, it's freeing up my time. Like everybody yeah. wanted a washing machine because it freed up so much time. And there was a there was a TED talk yeah. I saw. I, I, I don't remember the person's name. It was talking about like the liberation of women and how much time they had in their that is in their days. Right. Now that there was a washing machine doing that terrible, yeah. terrible work. And so, yeah, it, I mean, I think there's a there's a spectrum as there is for most things is we can. And, but, you know, opinion gets into it and then things get heated for no reason. People are arguing about <laughs> how, you know, how great air fryers are or how useless air fryers are when it's like, well, there's different factors to consider here. Yeah, there are. Um, I mean, there's there's definitely something to be said for uh, enjoying the routines that are slower and more manual, and that can be part of the experience. And some people seem to to think that what they value there is what everybody else should do too, you know, and I, I deal with this. Um, uh, if, if you're new here today, I like to process a lot of meat on a large scale. <clears throat> and, uh, there are parts of that, that I enjoy automating. I want to, I want to do it as efficiently and quickly as possible. And there are other parts that I do the slow way. Seasoning is one thing that I really enjoy hand seasoning and hand padding every single piece of meat to make sure that the seasoning I, w I want, like uh, you talk about thorough penetration. Ooh, is that an issue with seasoning? You've got to make sure it's in every little nook and cranny on each piece of meat. And depending on how you've cut it and just the natural, uh, natural kind of tenor of that cut of meat, everyone requires a little bit of, of unique attention. I, I love that. I love that process. And it goes against anything. Like I got a, a meat uh, supply catalog in the mail like an hour ago and I was flipping through and there's stuff that would, that would cut down the time from, from two hours uh, that I do on a thing to, to probably 10 minutes. And I don't, I don't want that. I don't want that, but I'm also not going to uh, criticize anybody else. Who's like, yeah, I want to just push a button for this step and there's no value in like doing it the hard way. You know, the, the tradition uh, is of no value to them and, and that's totally okay. And I think when people um, have a problem with somebody else having a differing opinion there, uh, then we get into those bizarre fights, yeah. you know, and some people like to wash and dry dishes after a meal and, and, you know, stand there and talk about stuff and, you know, they enjoy that. Uh, other people want to free up 15 minutes of their time so they can go do whatever. And if it takes two hours for a machine to do the job, so what they've gotten their 15 minutes. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it's, I think it is, you know, that was one of the things that kept coming up in the dishwasher discussion is people enjoy the meditative aspects of hand washing. And mm -hmm. I mean, personally, I good for them. I don't yeah. think that I would, <laughs> I would find it just, <laughs> why am I doing this? But, um, you know, I, I, one of my hobbies, which I recognize is objectively ridiculous, is uh, analog photography. And I'm to the point now where mm. I'm developing color film on my own, which is not sensible. Like, there's no reason to all. be doing this. I could send it to a no. lab. It's not worth my time. It's not, it's probably not as good results as if I send it to a lab, or even better, I just use a digital camera. But there is a craft aspect to it that I really enjoy. So, that's why I'm doing it. So yeah, it's, it's that, it's that wild spectrum of opinion that's out there is the, what do people, if, if there's a part of it that they enjoy, even if they're being told, well, you could do this instead, that's not going to register. And I understand why it's, it can be frustrating when you're on the persuading side, but I get it. There's it, to, the difference is you don't hate people who use digital cameras. <laughs> you don't think they're, they're subhuman because they, they have an SD card in their pocket. <laughs> I, I guess that's fair. Um, I, I do have issues with... Um, Unless you do, certain, that would be its own conversation. No, 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 no. I'm thinking of like um, every time I've the two... Uh, my video on drip coffee makers, I just had to be like, my standards are not that high. Get over it. <laughs> and so... Yeah, I totally understand when people are like, how dare you? You're torturing that coffee, putting it through a drip coffee machine. And it's like, I just want a cup of hot brown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there are a couple of things that I wanted 
there are just kind of anecdotes I wanted to share. And then one kind of big question that, you know, there's no answer to. So we'll just fumble our way through it. Uh, the first thing is that we, we like secretly, Alec, you secretly sort of dropped one of the future Libra rules episodes that we're, we're going to do uh, on TCU uh, where, when you said people can't imagine the alternative. Uh, Matt, you and I will talk mm. for well over an hour about the phrase people can't imagine the alternative. So uh, listeners of the Create Unknown can look forward to that because that is going to be an entire episode. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that we, I can't believe we didn't mention this earlier and I'm not going to f get through this podcast without mentioning the fact that one of like the only popular science channel shows of the last like 20 years is how it's made, which is oh, yeah, just yeah. a show that <laughs> kind of, like goes to factories and shows you how like matches and like flashlights and bowling pins are made and that's the whole show and that show is so popular that it would they just run episodes of that all day on that channel and people sit there and watch it so what's inside is a sister concept too where it it showed you know early on it showed you just what the inside of things looked like mm -hmm. you know and and that wasn't fully a, a how it works how it's made sort of thing but, but it's like okay Take a look at what this really is on the insides because you don't, you, you've never seen uh, what the middle of a bowling ball looks like. Hmm. You know, even something like a, a baseball or a golf ball, uh, when you see the little videos of those being slowly crushed, you know, with like 3,000 pounds of pressure and they explode and like all the rubber bands and, and the cork ball and stuff blows in every direction. Like that's, that's cool content. Uh, and so whether it's being detailed and explained, I think people, uh, they, they loved on how it's made. I'm, I'm glad that you, you brought that up because that is what we're talking about, you know? And even when it's a quick little bite, like let's cut a thing in half or let's, let's smash it with pneumatics. Uh, people are into that, Yeah, but there's, there's not, not, not much beyond that out there. Is there? No, but, but, but I, I wanted to mention how it's made. Cause do you like, I'm sure that you've watched that show. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. And I think. If you don't mind, I'm going to pull on a thread, but I'm going to answer this question first. Um, I because it's related. I think the the thing with how it's way, how it's made, what's inside, you can see and understand what's happening or what it is. It can be explained to you. Um, and then when we talk about like a computer, it's a black box that runs software that smarter people than me have written, and then things happen. But other than that, it's a black box. And so I I do think the um, the thing the value people find out of how it's made and whatnot is because it is relatively accessible to understand you're seeing it happen you're seeing raw materials turn into a finished product or something like that um but to pull on a thread which uh let me know if you don't want to go down this rabbit hole when you say people can't imagine the alternatives that has been a gigantic frustration of mine in my videos on electric cars because there are some concepts that i do not know why I cannot convey to people because I think I think if there's an explanation it's because until it's a real thing in their life that they're using and touching, it doesn't feel real enough to believe someone on the internet telling them. But I tweeted a few weeks ago, I want to get to the bottom of the idea that 200 miles is 50 miles because that's a thing that comes up a lot is I will say my car, I can get from Chicago into Iowa on a single charge. That's a long distance. And yet that doesn't register with tons of people. They're like, I could never imagine a car that can only go that far before I need to refuel it. And it's literally, I could not imagine. And I don't know where that comes from, but it's, it's frustrating <laughs> from my point, from my point of view. Yeah. Well, I think this is at the, the bottom of a lot of frustration and a lot of things that people are upset about, uh, because they, they can't imagine and they, you know, just smash their heads on that <laughs> ceiling, the cognitive ceiling. They can't get through it, and it, and they're annoyed by that. Um, here's here's the big uh, here's the big question: Is technology slowing down? I've been thinking about this a lot lately because of two things, kind of specifically. One is Web 3.0, like NFTs and the metaverse. All of that is cr has crashed and burned. Like anybody look at. Uh, Facebook slash Meta's stock lately. 
not yeah. good. I don't know how many billions of dollars yeah. that they've lost on the metaverse, but it is many of those billions of dollars. And yeah, the NFT, all of like the web 3.0 bubble has burst really hard. I, I don't know much about uh, it to, to say specifically, but I know there's something just today that's like really blowing up. I saw CoffeeZilla talking about something that like crashed and burned really hard that people are freaking out about. I'm sorry, that's vague, but it has something to do with with this sort of thing. Um, and just to kind of tech companies in general are all struggling right now. All of their stocks are going down. There's a lot of layoffs happening with all of the tech companies and there just doesn't seem to be too much innovation going on. <laughs> what, just, what happened? Stuff- I, I, th- I'm so sorry, but as you're talking about the layoffs and stuff like that, it popped into my head like, you can't even tell them to learn to code because that's just what they got fired from. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's true. Yeah, you can't tell yeah. them to learn to code. That, that was their job, and now they're out of that too. So it's <sighs> like, well, seriously, is this stuff, are we in like a really weird moment? When it comes to technology, what do you think about that? Like being stagnant? Yeah. As far as like the, well, I don't want to say we're stagnant. Like I think the, um, the energy marketplace, and maybe that's part of why it's so fascinating to me is because I do see places to go as far as cleaner energy, uh, storage and all those sorts of things. But certainly like, you know, um, like my desktop computer that's sitting down here. I don't remember when I got it, but it's been five years. I have no reason to upgrade it. Like, what do I need to do? It it handles my 4K camera content. It renders video in 15 to 20 minutes. Like, what more do I need? I'm not going to do anything. I, I'm not going to do anything else. And so you have seen that as far as in personal computers, they get a little bit faster every year. But is it doing anything more for me? Not really. And if we're looking at the broader picture with uh, tech companies and whatnot, I think I think people like with NFTs, most people saw that like there's no value here you're buying an idea that people have to believe in it's it would be it's it was very interesting seeing the same people argue fiat currency doesn't mean anything but this nft means a lot to me (laughs) and it's like you're literally just that's kind of the same concept it's just that currency is something we all agree (laughs) on because that's how the world works but Anyway, um, this fake thing is worthless, but but my fake thing is is actually <laughs> quite important. <laughs> right, right, and <laughs> and so I think that what it is is people are like people are not as dumb as many people would like to think they are, and so people are starting to see there's no value here. And I think the metaverse. I'm not that well versed on uh, where they're trying to go. I haven't. I don't use Facebook anymore. I don't really know anything about what the company is doing, but. It seems like the justifications they're giving for the metaverse are really contrived and people see that. And I think that that's just what's starting to happen is that the new and exciting things that the tech companies were doing have been around long enough that they're no longer new and exciting. And when it comes down to when when we get right down to it, the meaningful things about social media or a lot of what big tech does are human things. And we're all in this for, with each other. We are what make this interesting. And uh, yeah, I think that they're just running out of meaningful ways to change things. And every new solution that comes out tends to have some problem that's not foreseen. And then we're just right back to where we were. So I, I do think things are slowing down for a bunch of reasons. I don't know exactly what they are, but it's just... Uh, uh, I've been rambling for a while, but like as an example, my laptop, I got a new laptop because my old one was starting to get in the way. 10 years ago, I would have been so excited about getting a new laptop. It would have obsessed over like the keyboard and just had such a fun time unboxing it. And now it's like, it's an appliance. That's <laughs> it became all boring. It, it, it became, became boring. boring. We've come full circle. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, maybe that's, I have a question that's about what it this, is. Though. We're all just bored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my understanding of of the metaverse and Web 3.0 and all of that is uh, just I, I can't even come up with the right word for how impossibly scant it is. Uh, but my question, if either of you guys can answer this, what need is the metaverse meant to satisfy that that I have? Because that's why I don't get it. I don't know what I don't know what it's supposed to do for me. Like you talked about the contrived messaging and, and like realizations 
or justifications for it. And yeah, it hasn't made sense to me at all. And when I think about what it's even supposed to do, I don't have an answer for that. Well, the, I understand the, NFTs better than the metaverse, the, but I don't get the it. Pe- people who are like online all the time, mm-hmm. it, you're supposed to have like online versions of things that sort of make you more unique in your online persona. It, it's essentially okay. becoming like a full time online person, which stuff like that has existed forever in like World of Warcraft and, yeah. you know, Roblox yeah, that, or whatever, though. like there are senses of that, but it's trying mm-hmm. to to expand that into like other things, like playing cards, like you're gonna have or uh, like trading cards. Well, I have like a digital yeah. version of this trading card, and isn't that worth a whole lot of money? And uh, seemingly, <laughs> everyone's answer is no. It's like having a digital version of the thing sucks, and no one cares. We want. A physical version of it. There was a report that came out yesterday that I laughed at. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't laugh, but I mean, I did because it's so perverse that supposedly part of these meta layoffs, the like severance package included like real estate in the metaverse. Oh, no. Which is like, no. What? <laughs> uh, you know, maybe 25 years from now, I'll look like a fool for not having Oceanside property in the metaverse, but as of today, 2022, that seems yeah. laughably stupid to yeah, me. Yeah, I, I find that unlikely. I think, I think your assessment <laughs> is probably correct. Uh, it, I, I think, like to answer what the metaverse is trying to do, it's trying to say, okay, well, we have all these online alternatives for things in the real world, but they're not quite like the real world. So let's just try to blur that line more. Like I think I saw something about. This is probably not correct, but like you would float currently, but soon you'll be able to walk. There will be legs or are the legs there now? Yes, that was a big announcement. Legs. Are are they active? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they're coming. Well, legs pending. You walk your way into the UPS store and there's a person you can talk to behind a virtual counter as if like a phone call. I mean, sometimes I wonder, it's like, is this just ways to get at those of us that don't want to make a phone call? But want something more than a chat bot? I don't know. It is. That's such a niche to me because I, I did see one thing that made a lot of sense and it was people having a meeting in, in the metaverse thing. And I'm like, oh, I can see this in a, in a way being better than it, just a group call and seeing the little pictures of everybody. Like it, it's conceivable that this is, is a viable thing, but everything else is that niche purpose. Like you just described where it's like, do you need that medium between a phone call and a real experience? We talked um, we talked with with Schlatt about conversations with the butcher, right? wasn't wasn't that him? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, talking to butchers and like having these uh, real life conversations. and it, that, that's cool, but that's a very specific purpose. <laughs> I, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't need this. They must think that, that enough people need this or will want it, but it feels to me like the whole thing is, is uh, it's like post-apocalyptic. No it's like you have to go into the metaverse cause you can't go outside. <laughs> That's the only thing I could think of where it kind of makes any sense. Yeah. You know what? Yeah, I had a show on Amazon that peripheral, the peripheral, is that it? It's on Amazon. Uh, yeah. I've watched a few episodes. Yeah. It's actually quite good, but that takes place in like a, a futuristic kind of metaverse uh, in in a way that isn't as like ridiculous as as what we're talking about, you know, getting getting legs to talk to the UPS store. <laughs> it it is. I don't know what to think about it. I just think that it's. I guess if if I could if I can pre or I suppose the rationale is everybody has the science fiction future in their head of we're all going to be in a virtual world. Uh, talking to each other, and there have to be stepping stones to get there. And I would imagine that the people who are working on the metaverse and truly believe in it, because I know there are people who do, think this is that first step to get there. And maybe it is, but I think that people aren't engaging with the question, is this where we want to go? Because I think most of the science fiction uh, representations of such a world, they're pretty bleak. That that That's my entire re- response like 
gutturally to it where it's like no 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 we need to be yeah, going the opposite exactly. here like we need to be connecting in real <laughs> yeah. life with people more not yeah, less yeah. this is the complete opposite of where we should be going as a civilization not deeper into this like weird loneliness zone and uh for you know we need to return to some sort of like the warmth uh, we were talking to Jabril about this, like the warmth of seeing mm, Jabril yeah. in person at VidCon is way different hey. than seeing, nice, yeah. you know, seeing you right now over a discord call. Like it's not the same and it's worse. It is worse. This is, it, it's nice that we can do this because we're so far apart. That's, that's amazing. And I don't take that for granted. And I am really grateful for that. At the same time, I also recognize it would be better to be in the same room right now and then go get dinner after this. That would be better. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if the metaverse is basically like the uncanny valley of reality where we all understand in this in this uh, video call that like we know what's happening here and we know that real life would be better and people can imagine, well, what if we were floating in a virtual space and we could actually see our facial expressions, not like you can't right now, but like on, on an avatar uh, and that would be better. But I think that at least my reaction, it is a very uncanny valley type thing where it's like, no, that's worse. I can't, <laughs> I can't deal with adding more, like trying to get more of the things you get out of a real life interaction plopped onto an avatar is not going to work. Well, I wanted to ask you uh, a question before we launch into uh, to the patron questions. So, and this is. I, I can't imagine a topic that is less related to what we're currently talking about. So, so get ready for the U-turn. I clean up a, a lot of stuff outside. Uh, I, I've talked about this on the podcast quite a lot. I dig up a lot of things. Uh, the property that I live on is, is kind of junkyardish in that way. You know, it was a, a repair, machinery repair for a long time, and uh, an operating farm for a long time. Uh, at, at one point in history, it was uh, the, the most prudent solution for dealing with your trash was to burn it. So, uh, you know, you get a bunch of things that didn't burn that are now in the ground. Well, I dig up all these things and, and almost all of them are disintegrated or they're broken. There is one thing that I dig up eh, with some frequency. I'd say about one a month. I find one and it is almost never, ever broken. And that is a light bulb. Now, I'll get a light bulb that's been in the ground for so long that uh, the the E26 base, you know, so it's it's like relatively modern, uh, the metal screw in base, all of that has totally rotted and disintegrated. It's rusted out completely. There is nothing left except the bulb. And unless there's like highly concentrated pressure on one part of a light bulb, it doesn't break. So like I can step on the thing if it's in the ground and it won't crack. And I cannot believe that this thing that I think of as being one of the most fragile items in my house, an old, you know, uh, regular pre LED light bulb is somehow like the strongest thing in the ground that cannot be killed. <laughs> Do you have any answers for this? Because it's like blown my mind for 10 years. It's probably just the geometry of it's close to a sphere and glass doesn't decompose or I guess it does, but over like many thousands of years, it's like how um, eggs so are actually quite strong, but we don't, mm. that we don't picture them as strong because we are so accustomed to being able to puncture them at will. Although that's not, you know, we do always all look at the cartons to see is there a broken one in here. So that's not a perfect explanation, but I imagine it's mostly just, it's a spheroid made of glass and, you would think it would be fragile, but spheres, even when they're very, very thin, can surprise you. Yeah, well, that one uh, it has just shocked me. I mean, I see all manners of things that are built strong, and uh, but even like even even jars don't have that staying power. They're almost always shattered. Uh, we talked about soda bottles a few weeks ago. Those old torpedo shaped bottles from the eighties. Those are pretty good. They, they hold up pretty well, uh, but they shatter more often than, than the light bulbs do. It's just like, this is the weirdest thing to me that the thinnest possible glass happens to be in a shape that, that can withstand, you know, 50 years of being trod on. Well, and I should say it, it's, I don't, I have no expertise here, but you know, the, 
they had to be partially evacuated. So they, they do have to withstand atmospheric pressure. And it could be that there is something special about the glass that I'm not aware of. But, um, mm. but certainly it is, it would definitely be interesting to me. I'm just trying to come up with an explanation. <laughs> We should yeah. throw that well, to no, Destin. I, I, no, I threw it at you. Seems like a, a Destin question. He would love that. Um, real quick, before we go to the patron questions, I want to circle back to the eggs because I have found out the hard way how hard it is to crack an egg uh, because I'm an idiot and I would do videos where I would you know, do a joke and smash an egg over my head. Ooh. Okay, guess what? Uh, uh, listeners at home, for the love of God, please pierce the egg with a pin before you smash it over your head. If you don't, it's not going to break. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's going to hurt. It's like just hitting yourself in the head with an iron ball, basically. It hurts <laughs> like hell and it doesn't smash. It doesn't do what you think it's going to do. You seriously have to puncture it with a pin and then it will collapse. It will blow up on your head and it's awesome and it's a great gag. But uh, without that that pinhole, holy cow, those are freaking hard, and you you'll just you'll just crack your skull with it. I have. <laughs> <laughs> you hurt yourself with an egg. Yeah, it hurts. <laughs> uh, well, it, it, we're gonna start with um, with Maple's question. Uh, Maple uh, is a big fan and says that he loves how you explain things in a simple and understandable way, and that's something we didn't fully. Uh, we didn't fully kind of praise you for earlier on is it would be easy to make a lot of these videos convoluted and difficult and too complex, but, but they're not, <laughs> you know, you take some really tough concepts sometimes uh, and put them in a digestible way. So I'm glad that Maple pointed that out, yeah, but he wants to know uh, out of the videos that you've made, uh, what's the favorite one that you've made? Well, the, the dishwasher video is definitely my favorite as far as being impactful. Uh, just because I love being able to see the response to that and actually helping people out get get a better dishwashing performance in their life. I think that's something we all deserve. Um, but as far as, oh boy, this is opening a can of worms. The video I recently <laughs> just did on the Olympus Pen has been one that I've been saving for a long time because I'm really fascinated by that camera and I was really happy to explain it, but it didn't perform very well. And that's mm. just, I think, because... My my rationalization for that is that I have been playing around with hobbyist cameras my entire life, so I understand what exposure is and I understand how to use cameras without them being automated. But probably 90% of the world is just used to a point-and-shoot camera. So when you tell them, yeah, there's a camera from 1962 that has a solar cell on it, it doesn't need batteries, and it has automatic exposure, that's not impressive. And I think that's been, I think that was a source of my disappointment, but that I don't know if it's my favorite video, but that was a topic that I was really looking forward to exploring. It's been one of my you know, back burner to or back pocket topics or like, hold on to this for when you really need a good one. And uh, <laughs> it just didn't do what I wanted it to do. And is there one that that you're really excited to make in the future? Like, is there one topic that's going to be your magnum opus that, that you're just perpetually working on? Nah, not really. Um, there are certain things that I want to uh, d do videos on and discuss. There's there's things that I'm very excited about, but I wouldn't say there is something like a magnum opus. It's just I do what I'm interested in. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it, we're going to hit Vibecat's question because uh, we like Vibecat around here, and we're pleased that that you apparently saved his life with your air conditioner video when he lived in a basement apartment. So that, that was good. Five cat would have baked in that poor little basement. Uh, but, but now he's alive and, and that's excellent for all of us. Uh, but he's asking about electric cars uh, and saying that, that you were working on, on the video for years as you went through the process of, of owning one and, and, and using one. At what point in that process, did you realize that there was a video in the making and, and did that, did that alter uh, your trajectory with electric ve vehicles? Well, actually, there is one of the oldest videos on my channel, I think has maybe 28,000 views, and it's called The Wind Powered Car. And it, oh, <laughs> sorry, my cat just appeared on the back of my chair. Hey, there um, we go. That's a good cat. What's the cat's name, by the way? Reed. We need this. R E E D. Reed? 
Yeah, I did not choose that name. That's, name. that's his, uh, the shelter where I got him names animals that are brought in for the people who bring them in. So he's Reed. Oh, that's cool. Um, so that, that video, which needs to be updated, I took my Chevy Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid, although I don't like it being called that, but we don't need to get into that, uh, to a wind farm and just did a an explanation of this one wind turbine. We can do the math to figure out how fast it's recharging cars. And so if the Volt could take all the power that this wind turbine is generating safely and charge the battery, it would charge in some... I think it was less than a minute. Like there's a ton of power coming out of this wind turbine and you could put it in. I think the figure was 5,000 miles an hour as far as like spreading it out to a whole bunch of cars. So electric vehicles have been part of my channel for a very long time, but it has been, it, it was probably doing the, like the winter range test on the bolt when I started to realize, well, actually I don't have a great answer for this question because it is, I think, been going on longer than maybe the asker realized um but as far as the big video of the electric vehicle charging guide or what did i title that i don't even remember but uh the beginner's guide to electric vehicles that was a big culmination of all the smaller videos that i've done realizing the talking points that people discuss some in good faith some in not um and putting that all together okay yeah i imagine that's uh uh, an entire sphere of content that <laughs> is going to be around for a while. There's going to be quite a lot to say as you you continue to go through it and as as it continues to develop. Um, we have a few more. Uh, uh, oh, oh, here's a quickie from uh, Barflug. Hmm, I do this every week. Barflug Narvan, uh, who uh, was here for a moment but had to had to jet out, but made sure they got this question in first. Uh, I've noticed that that in a number of your videos, you have referenced They Might Be Giants. What's your favorite album or song? Oh, this is not a good question because, you know, I I have <laughs> not really been keeping up with them in the last five years or so. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I am a fan of They Might Be Giants, but I'm just, um, what is the latest album? I think Glean is the latest that I've actually listened to. And... Yeah. Sorry to disappoint. Is there a favorite? Let me ask this question. If somebody said, I've never heard anything from They Might Be Giants, give me a song to listen to that you you think I'll like. What what song do you throw them? Well, I mean, the, the answer that everybody's going to give is Birdhouse in Your Soul, which is, you know, I feel bad giving that as an answer, but I do think it's true. It's got it was their biggest hit because it's a great song. But I do also mm. I get stuck in my head quite a lot. Museum of Idiots. That's a that's a good one as well. Okay. Well, if you haven't heard They Might Be Giants, it's time to search Museum of Idiots. Get that as your first listening experience. Uh, we're on to Wiffle Butter, who, who uh, talks about your brown video and how brown's your favorite color. Uh, I am also a brown supremacist. All, almost all of my clothes are brown or earth tones or things that match with brown. I own virtually nothing that isn't in the brown family. Um, but uh, the question here is that, that brown is not a common common favorite color. Do you have any other unpopular favorites in your life? Oh, boy. Um, licorice. I really like licorice. Ooh, yes. And I understand that, like, licorice all sorts. One of my favorite Black candies. Or red. Oh, okay. You're okay with any Oh, yeah. Any, red licorice uh, is not flavor. licorice. I can't stand. It's, it's cherry. It's this fruity candy. It's not licorice. Like, I d- this is This good. is a... There's not licorice is the flavor as anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Now this, this is a thing that like, Oh, since a little kid, I'd always be like red vines are cherry flavored gummy sticks. It's not licorice. Yes. Um, so yes, (laughs) that would be an unpopular favorite of mine. Um, that's probably the biggest one as far as like foods. But just in general, you know, I, I call myself a tortured Midwesterner all the time. It's because I, I strive for adequate and I don't really ever want to maximize anything in my life. It's just like, will this work? Yes. Good. As far as like, I, I made like the it. comment recently. Um, I don't understand. Well, like again, thinking of refrigerators, does it refrigerate box checked? Okay. A okay. That's just a general <laughs> life philosophy of mine is kind of unpopular, but that's, that's where we are. 
Well, I got a quarter pound of black jelly beans for my birthday and I savored them. I ate like one a day until they were gone. It's, it's a, a fantastic flavor. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, so it, the last uh, of the patron questions, this is really good. Uh, it's, it's also, we're going to pull a vibe cat in one more time. Do you have any thoughts on belts versus suspenders? And, and I have an add on to this question when you've answered. Well, I think I have been wearing, I was wearing suspenders in one or two videos. So that might be the, the reason this question got asked. Um, I have since stopped wearing suspenders mainly because they're kind of awkward to wear if you're not tucking in your shirt. I mean, they're kind of impossible to wear if you're not tucking mm, yeah, in your shirt. That makes sense. And so I don't really have strong opinions either way. But when I worked professionally and needed to, you know, dress up, I really was the obnoxious guy wearing the suspenders and a bow tie because that's mm. just me. That's awesome. I, I used to wear a lot of suspenders uh, where I, you know, I had to sew the buttons in to the front of my pants to hook the suspenders on. Uh, and it was it was worth the time to sit down and sew uh, to be able to unlock those. Um, it, do you think that do you think that suspenders will will come back to general use? That's my follow up. Is 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 this something that like ebbs and flows? Uh, have we are we past peak suspender? I think we're probably past peak suspender. There is a weirdness to them when they're pulling up on your pants. The inseam area can be a little weird feeling sometimes and. Uh, I mean, if they're not elastic and they're sized exactly right, I suppose that wouldn't be a problem. But I don't know how many suspenders are out there that are not elastic to some extent. All right. Well, we have uh, one last question. It's the question we'd like to end on with all of our guests. And uh, it is it's from me. And it is this. What makes an interesting person? What do, what do you think makes someone interesting? How does one become an interesting person? I think number one is just to be curious about the world and want to want to find out whatever they can about the things in their life um i I think that curiosity is definitely the that's it i mean i i think that people who aren't curious about anything just aren't very interesting if i put it that way yeah well alec you're certainly an interesting person uh technology connections is a wonderful channel if anyone hasn't checked it out yet well, then you're welcome because this episode just blessed you with a lot of great videos that you could now uh, sit back and enjoy and learn things that you didn't know that you would be interested in. And that's really kind of the great thing about technology connections. And um, Alec explains the things in a way that's really entertaining, but also informative and also simple enough for you to follow along. So, you know, it's not too complex, but at the same time, you uh, you kind of feel smarter afterwards. You, you, you can, you can't not feel smarter after one of his videos. So, uh, that's it for us. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was great having you finally on the create unknown. It, it really has been a pleasure. So, uh, thanks so much. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday. Please join us then. Uh, if you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash the create unknown and become a patron and join us here every Tuesday on discord. Join the discord, become a patron. All right, we're out of here. See you space cowboys. Thanks for listening to the create unknown. We make this show with the support of our patrons. 100% of that goes directly to keeping episodes going every week. And the recent support has been amazing. Sid Poke, NRM, Venture Addicts, Weezer Good, you all really do make this show happen. Thank you to the Tots and Dumpster crew, old and new, who save tiny little lives every month. Thank you to our grizzled, battle-hardened child infantry. Clemente De Los Santos, Dan the Latch, Demetrius Andrews, Erica, Farrakhan, Jen Mefasanti, Kevin Menard, Mikhail Steinke, Monahim, Natsu, Penny Peddler, Risebread, Ryan Kinder, Samuel Manser, Sean S., Sean Malone, and Tom Videoger. And a tremendous shout out to our elite baby gang commanders. Atrocious Guff, Cat, Dojangles, Graham Robertson, James Gallagher, Jeff Davis, Orange Vanilla Coke, Patrick Pister, TCU's personal pilot, Andy, Ryan Carroll, Baseweight, Vinthos, Yetis Deletus, Jonas Walter, Nathan Robinson, Chelksies, and of course, Trevstead. You are the elite. Thank you as well to our indentured servants, producer-editor Ben Webster, Minecraft mogul Laterman, Discord kitten wrangler Conrad, and producer emeritus Dan Yoshua. Thanks to Baseweight for use of Created in the Unknown for the opening theme. Thanks to Electro Voice for giving us mics to sound good on top of it. And a special thanks to Main Gear for powering all of our PC endeavors. The Create Unknown is an unknown media production in partnership with Studio 71.